Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. My name is Marcus Grodi, your host for this weekly program in which I have the great privilege of introducing to you men and women who, because of their great love for Jesus Christ, were brought home to the church. And tonight our guest is Deacon Nathan Allen. He's a former evangelical. He's got a wonderful story and uh, uh, an amazing childhood in terms of where you learned to love Jesus is different than most of our viewers. But, uh, but before I ask you to do that, I'm going to remind the audience that you're an essential part of the program. So if you have any questions or emails, you can contact us at 1-800-221-9460. Outside North America, you can call us at 205-271-2980, or you can send us an email at journeyhome at ewtn.com. Deacon, welcome to the Journey Home. Thank you. It's great to have you here. And uh, I know that there's folk who are watching who aren't Catholics, who have deacons in their particular traditions that are a bit different than the Catholic deacons. So maybe later in the program you can help them understand what your calling is as a deacon. Because that's, uh, you know, I think there's some Catholics that don't quite understand the calling of a deacon and appreciate the wonderful opportunity we're given mm -hmm. by the Lord and his church to serve as a deacon. But let me get out of the way and invite you as easy to do to give us a little summary of your spiritual background. All right, well th thanks. Um, I was uh, raised an evangelical Protestant. My parents were missionaries in Japan. Huh. And uh, so I, I grew up in Japan uh, um, with a, uh, my parents were with the uh, Send International Mission Board, which is a, a very um, evangelical mission board and uh, with uh, uh, missionaries in a number of different countries, mostly in the Far East, in uh, uh, Korea and Taiwan, Japan, Philippines and so forth. Uh, but uh, have uh, since branched out throughout uh, the world. And that was the environment I was raised in. I was my, my father is a, was a scholar, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, uh, and particularly a biblical scholar, though his uh, training was in linguistics and second language acquisition theory for adults. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, uh, my upbringing, my parents really instilled in me from an early age a love of Jesus Christ and a love of sacred scripture. Hmm. It sounds like the mission board that you're with um, went to areas that had not really been converted to a large extent by Christianity. That's right, with the exception really of the Philippines. Oh, okay, um, so they did the, go to the Philippines. Yeah. Cause it sounded, there are many mission boards that purposely go to Catholic areas mm -hmm. to save those folk from the, you know, the whore of Babylon, but it, right. your mission group was more to those, almost like Paul saying, I've gone, where someone hasn't been there that's before. That's right, that's right. And, and, and the old name of the mission, they changed the name to Send International when they started going into more places. But when I was growing up, really, it was the Far Eastern Gospel Crusade. Oh. Because the point was that it was going to uh, um, countries in the Far East, particularly uh, uh, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, and, and of course the Philippines. Um, they, the mission had you know, missed China you know, before uh, Mao. Uh, Mm. Came because it kind of the, the, that mission board actually rose in the fifties. So uh, uh, China was Taiwan as far as we were concerned. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, so, um, but uh, my parents, you know, people of strong faith, deep faith, mm. loving love of Jesus. My father and mother, very different people. My father, as I was saying, was a scholar, and instilled from a really early age in me, and then also in my my sisters and my brother you know, a, a, a love of learning, of reading. Um, and my mother was, a, you know, much more, you know, a simple person, not, not, uh, not a scholar by any stretch, but a deeply uh, spiritual woman, um, very much uh, uh, um, in love with Jesus and, uh, um, and showed that love for, f love for our Lord, really in how she loved us. And how she loved our father, and you know, and and uh, helped him in you know in supporting his ministry. Uh, well, what amazing vocation know. for the two of them to to go to Japan for that. Right, right. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, just a, in particular, my my mother and I call her my mother because I my my mother my birth mother I was uh, my uh, mother uh, passed away when I was four months old, and mm -hmm. so uh, leaving me and the three older sisters. Uh -huh. You know the oldest one, six years old, and this wow. other, this woman who was a missionary, single missionary, in Japan, and had we'd always known her as Auntie Dorothy. You know, um, she uh, she took us on, and you know, and, wow. and uh, uh, my father, uh, they got married a, a couple of years after uh, my mother passed away, and so she's really the only mother I've known, and she loved us as much mm. as mm. 
as as you know you you, you know I, I never even think of her as my stepmother or anything <laughs> like that. Just a deep love of, the, of of us, love of our father, love of the faith, and uh, um, and uh, so from an early age, I was really um, impressed with the importance of reading sacred scripture, reading the Bible, and um, and then also introduced to other uh, literature. And uh, um, C.S. Lewis was a big one. <laughs> and uh, then, of course, uh, uh, C.S. Lewis's friend, J.R.R. Tolkien. And uh, so reading C.S. Lewis and, you know, first through the Narnia stories, and you know, as I get older, reading more and more of his, uh, of his apologetics, um, mere Christianity and so forth, there was so much to learn. Um, but the thing that struck me always as I was reading C.S. Lewis was that he wasn't stopping at mere Christianity. He laid that out, but then he was always moving toward what he called more Christianity. And it fascinated me, this sort of sacramental Anglicanism, because it was something completely outside of my tradition that I was raised in. And that fascinated me. And there were some things in Tolkien, too, this real sense of the sacred uh, uh, that would just seep into his writing. Um, the Lord of the Rings and the Silmarillion especially, um, that as I was growing up and in love with these books that really impressed me with a sense, oh, I wish somehow that I had that, that I had this sort of sacramental sense. I didn't call it that, you know, but there, there was this sort of impressed upon me that there was something that, that what I was raised in was true as far as it went, and I'm I've never been, I never regretted what I had, but that there was something more that I yearned for. And I started to see inklings of that in other uh, um, uh, religious expressions. Growing up in Japan, of course, the principal religions are Shinto, which is an animist pagan religion, um, and Buddhism. Japanese Buddhism is very different from the Buddhism that you, you know, the Dalai Lama or from, you know, uh, uh, other, other parts of, of Asia. Um, there's a, in the Zen tradition, there's an emphasis on meditation, on quietness and quiet, you know, uh, 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 silent meditation, even walking meditation, something that was really, you know, for us as growing up as evangelicals, you know, <laughs> devotions was reading your Bible. That's what it was. It was reading. It was very much an intellectual exercise. And there was room for that kind of emotive, you know, relation with God and prayer and crying out and those groanings that cannot be uttered um, that the Spirit prays through us. But it was really an intellectual kind of thing. And, uh, and I, I, I longed for that sense of, you know, being able to quiet one's mind and just walk barefoot that was something that was present in this other tradition. And I wished that Christianity had that, you know, uh, because my only image of Christianity was what I was raised in. Um, the idea of sacred places where, um, that were set aside for, for this sort of thing um, always just uh, fascinated me. And then at the same time, I'm always reading Lewis and Tolkien. I'm also, you know, a young boy being introduced to the Arthurian legends and gobbling that stuff up and growing to love the Middle Ages and what had survived from the Middle Ages in the Arthurian legends and realizing now, of course, looking back, it's kind of hard to love the Middle Ages without loving the church that made them. <laughs> You know, and that's, uh, but, but having the sense, because the, the, what religion there is in the Arthurian legends is the Catholic Church. And then we had some neighbors when we lived at one, uh, in, in uh, part of Japan in the south, Okinawa, um, and there are a lot of military bases there. We lived, you know, uh, in, in a Japanese neighborhood, and some of the, of the higher ranking uh, officers might have houses off base. And uh, we had a neighbor who was Greek Orthodox, and he worked at one of the air bases. And his wife was a German Catholic. And I didn't know them very well. They were closer, of course, to my parents' age and, and everything. But I remember um, a time my father was talking to this neighbor of ours, and this neighbor said, you know, and my father, you know, would read the New Testament in Greek. I mean, he, you know, it was, it was easy to oh, yeah, him. Really 
He could speak fluently 12 or something like that. Right, yeah, yeah. He knew, uh, f he could read 15 languages and he was fluent in uh, speaking in three and he could read Amazing. Greek fluently. I mean, it was as easy <laughs> as reading as, as in English. So he would read the New Testament in Greek. And so our neighbor uh, asked him, I I'm, I'm curious, what does Koine Greek sound like, you know? And so dad read out uh, John chapter one to him. And he said, I'm flabbergasted. I can understand that. The language had changed so little. And he said it has changed so little because our liturgy is in that language and the scripture that you have just read, uh, we read in that language. And this was a sudden revelation to me mm. that there was something so old. Mm. And I longed for that age and that antiquity, that, you know, um, what what Saint Augustine, although I you know didn't know it at the time, but what Saint Augustine calls that beauty ever ancient, ever new. And those are some of those you know what I call my early warning signs of my conversion, <laughs> as I started to see these things and realize that what I had was beautiful and wonderful, but it didn't satisfy all those longings that I felt like, gosh, I wish we had something like that in in Christianity. And then, you know, I, um, another thing that was really, really struck me, and this is really probably the biggest thing, mm -hmm. was that I was struck with the disunity mm. among Protestant missionaries. We had, you know, our mission board was a, you know, your basic evangelical mission board, and there are a number of them. Theologically, not a whit of difference, mm. okay? In fact, let me just to clarify that if you went, if your family went home to raise money, you might one week speak at a Baptist church, the next week at a Presbyterian church, right. Absolutely. congregational. Absolutely. You were supported by evangelicals from a great variety of denominations. That's right. And, th and, that, and any given church might be supporting us and then supporting a missionary from a different mission board in, yeah. in Korea and a different mission you know, board in, in you know, Botswana. I mean, mm -hmm. So um, and not, a, not a whit of difference theologically between the missionaries in my parents' mission board and some of the others like, say, TEAM or uh, Christian and Missionary Alliance or the Baptist General Conference or any of these other, you know, sort of mm. basic uh, evangelical Protestant groups. But yet in Japan, a country that, is v that has proven very hard to evangelize, about something less than 1% of the population is Christian and of that roughly half is Catholic and half is Protestant. And, um, but in this, in a country like Japan, you'd have a tiny little church set up by a SEND international missionary with 50 people. I'm not talking families, I mean 50 people. And then just down the street, there'd be a team church with another, you know, two dozen, three dozen people, four dozen people. And then a few minutes away by train, another one. And I thought, this is really daft. Mm -hmm. I mean, not a whit of difference theologically. And yet, that disunity was there. Of course now uh, coming at it from Catholic eyes, I, you know, you see this sort of thing uh, uh, happening did you all over You did place. see it then though. I when saw you it then when I was a teenager. Because most don't yeah. see it at the time. Yeah, and I thought this is really crazy because we would get together with them. I went to school, I went to a, a, a Christian school, English language Christian school where, where, you know, my classmates were the children of these different missionaries. You know, and I, and I thought, this is really silly. If we had said, okay, you take Hokkaido, you take Shikoku, you take Kyushu, you take the Kansai part of, of Honshu, and you take the Kanto part of uh, Honshu, you know, and, and divided out the country into a sort of a territory, and then, you know, and, and you know, because there's nothing theologically separating these people. But yet you had these tiny little congregations, and it just... And that's what really struck me. That was something yeah. that right from the beginning, uh, you know, as a teenager, I w began to think this is, there's something wrong here. Because Jesus had prayed that they may all be one so that the world might believe. Mm -hmm. And the world clearly, at least in the context of 20th century Japan, was not believing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they weren't united. You know, did your, when you started reading C.S. Lewis, Tolkien, uh, were they at the advice of your father? Did he realize what you might be getting into at all? Uh, no, he, I mean, I'm sure he didn't. Though, you know, another thing, my father was, you know, his uh, reading was very eclectic, and one of the books that he really loved was uh, a little book by a Carmelite, uh, um, uh, Brother Lawrence, The Practice <laughs> of the Presence of God. Yeah. 
<laughs> and uh, and that was something that you know when I when I look back now I think isn't that strange, <laughs> but at the time you know I I thought that was a beautiful little book, yeah. and uh, and I still do. Well, how many Protestants you know. have encouraged people to read Thomas Aquinas's Imitation of That's Christ, right. That's and right. yet stop it before they get to the last chapter, which is about the Eucharist, right. or at least miss the the point of that. That's right. That's right. And and so you know I I had exposure in somewhat to to you know things like that but you know in Lewis it was you know we started the Narnia stories and you get right. reading them and 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 right. Lewis Lewis is always considered pretty safe you know uh, um, and Tolkien was fiction yeah. you know and so well the reason I mentioned that is that again there's an interesting thing that the Lord uses something but but, but often that's what kind of frustrates us sometimes that we know those who read those books and we want to say don't you see it mm -hmm. don't you why don't you see it or you you mentioned something which amazes me as I look back that I didn't see more, and that mm -hmm. is that confusion between these different groups on four corners of a of an intersection, right. basically believing the exact same things, yet not recognizing there's something wrong with this picture. You'd hard you'd have hard enough to get them together once a year for some kind of you know interchurch you know potluck or something. Yeah, you know, and uh, with us, you know, it was even more so because we were right there in the same school, going to the school with, you know, our, we had this English language school that was founded by six mission boards, you know, and so the students and supported by those mission boards, so the, 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 the children of missionaries of those boards got to go there for free, and then there was tuition for others, you know, and, yeah. and, and so forth. So we're, you know, praying with them, working, you know, with them. Uh, all the time, and that was that just struck me as just so strange. Isn't so you it? have all these seeds that are planted, mm -hmm. not really leaning into the Catholic Church. Probably wasn't even on your, you know, on your no. uh, radar screen at all. Not at so all. So what was it that got you really thinking about the Catholic Church? Well, I um, I came from Japan to uh, St. Paul, Minnesota, to go to college, to start college at Bethel College in St. Paul. And, uh, you know, it was really the first time for this, you know, scared 17-year-old boy to be away from home, you know. <laughs> uh, I wasn't quite 18 yet, and, you know, it's sort of the, the that being s away from home, you're suddenly cut out from, you know, who you are. And not and when you grow up in a foreign country, and this is a, an experience that so many people mm -hmm. uh, uh, who have grown up in that situation talk about, you don't really know what home is. I remember at age 17 coming into Los Angeles Airport with my passport to be stamped, you know, as so I'm coming into immigration. And the immigration official stamps my passport and says, welcome home. And I remember thinking right then, I'm not home, mm -hmm. and I don't even know where that is. <laughs> you know, MKs, right? Yeah, MKs. Absol absolutely. And I, you know, I hear this from you know, uh, kids who grew up in the diplomatic service too, you mm -hmm. know, they have that same kind of feeling. So, you know, clearly not Japanese, but not at all home here. <laughs> and uh, um, and then, you know, the sort of the inevitable, and it seems kind of trivial now, but, you know, the, the inevitable breakup with the high school girlfriend and, <laughs> and all this, you know, kind of spiraling out of control, I felt myself getting really into um, a sense of despair. Never really getting quite to the brink, mm -hmm. but enough to look into it and mm -hmm. see this chasm. And realizing I didn't want to go there. Mm -hmm. And not knowing how to pull back. Mm -hmm. And about that time, uh, I had a friend of mine, he was a couple years older, uh, upperclassman, and uh, he was Catholic. He, was, uh, uh, he had been raised Methodist and he had become a Catholic. And, you know, we, we got to chatting about whatever, and about the Catholic faith. And um, it was really an eye-opener to me hmm. to see, first of all, a very normal person who was Catholic, a very <laughs> intelligent person, a very uh, articulate person, a person with a deep faith who was Catholic. It was the first Catholic I really knew as a friend. I mean, you know, we are the neighbors, but I didn't know them all that H well. Had there been Catholic missionaries in the area that you had served? You know, I'm sure there were. I mean, we've seen nuns and, and you know, priests, and you know, there's a full hierarchy in Japan. You yeah, know, uh, right. it's not even mission territory anymore. There's right. a, a, a installed hierarchy, but I, you know, it didn't really uh, um, have much contact with them. 
uh, delivered the paper to a Catholic school, you know, but the, it was the, the Pacific <laughs> Stars and Stripes newspaper, you know, is to deliver that. But, um, you know, so this is the really the first serious Catholic that I knew as a friend. And suddenly I began to notice that all those things that I had wanted, the sense of sacred space, the sense of sacred time, um, uh, silent contemplative prayer, all these things that I had wished Christianity had, I found out Christianity did have. It's just that my particular brand in which I had been educated and raised didn't have it. And that was a real uh, uh, opening moment for me. And then as we got to talking, Lent was approaching uh, at that time. And you know, I had really gone toward that brink in despair and wanted to pull back. What I needed was penance. What I needed was conversion. And growing up in an evangelical background, you know, and the Lutherans don't have this experience, or Anglicans or other, uh, other Protestants might not, but growing up in an evangelical background, there are no liturgical seasons. You know, uh, there is no lectionary. There is Christmas Day, there's Easter Day, and then any other time in there, it's whatever the pastor wants to preach on, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and I had one pastor who used to joke that uh, he named his son Philip because Philippians was his favorite book because he'd preach on that particular <laughs> epistle over and over again. He'd get about halfway into his sermon and then he'd say, finally, and he'd say, see, well, you know, of course, you turn to Philippians to see Paul did that too, about beginning chapter three with the word finally, and then he goes on for another half of the book. Uh, but uh, but uh, um, this idea of having not only a time for penance, but sacred seasons just generally. Mm. And here were, you know, five weeks set aside for penance and fasting. The idea intoxicated me. Mm. I mean, there was nothing like it, and I was so ready for that. And uh, so uh, my friend uh, said to me, well, why don't we um, make a commitment to keep a Holy Lent, and let's talk about, uh, you know, what we're, what we're going to give up, what we're going to take on, what we're going to do as our disciplines. And so I took that very seriously. And then he asked me, well, why don't you come uh, with me to uh, Ash Wednesday Mass at the cathedral? And I had this sudden interior you know, like revulsion at the thought. Like, uh, and I thought, this is really, why am I thinking this? Because, why am I feeling this? Because I'm not thinking it. Mm -hmm. You know, everything is intellectually attractive to me about this prospect. So I, I, I swallowed that re revulsion and went there. And the Cathedral of St. Paul is a beautiful building. Mm -hmm. Very a large, it, until you know, the building of these dome stadiums, it was one of the largest interior dome structure in the country. Mm -hmm. You walk into it and it just lifts you up. Mm -hmm. There's almost no decoration at eye level. Everything is higher. So you come in there and you're just pulled up into this place. And I don't know if growing up, if anyone had actually said it quite so baldly, but the impression I got growing up was that there were about 300 years of Christianity, and then along came Constantine, and then there were 1,200 years of nothing, and then suddenly there's Martin Luther. <laughs> there's this huge gap where there's no church, yeah. for all intents and purposes. And I had the sense walking in there that there was no gap. And this was exactly what I wanted. This is exactly, you know, I, I had, you know, been introduced to St. Francis of Assisi earlier in the year, and he was a very uh, um, uh, 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 impressive figure to a, you know, a 19-year-old boy. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, I, I thought, you know, St. Francis is part of this. It's all one piece. And when I went up to receive the ashes that w uh, Ash Wednesday, I... You know, I'm not one to hear voices, and, but it was as, almost as if an audible voice had said <laughs> to me, this is the way, walk in it. The words from the prophet. Yeah. And I thought, all right, this is the way, walk in it. And I spent the next five years studying. I went through a course of inquiry that summer but declined to be received into the church at that time. This was, I was 19 years old, it was 1984. 
And uh, um, part of that was to satisfy my parents that this wasn't just a youthful indiscretion, you know. Um, but, but, but <laughs> Away from family. Uh, that's right. In, in, in the <laughs> States. But part of that was also um, I wanted to satisfy myself on every point of doctrine because I didn't want to be, you know, sort of a Protestant wannabe kind of Catholic. I wanted to be a Catholic. If I was really being called to be a Catholic, if this really was the church that Jesus Christ founded, I was going to be a Catholic's mm -hmm. Catholic. And so I, I did, uh, I consider a five-year catechumen as a study <laughs> and reading and reflection with a slight uh, detour. Um, um, but uh, uh, in the sa at the same time, I'd actually I'd met my, my wife, who uh, was on a similar uh, journey of discovery as a, uh, her, she, her father was an a evangelical free church pastor and we met at Bethel and uh, she began you know discovering liturgy and and, and so forth and, and uh, but she had no interest in becoming Catholic and so I had this sort of brief flirtation with Canterbury um, <laughs> and my, my wife is an Episcopalian uh, today and but we had this 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 uh, brief flirtation with Canterbury where uh, you know I was hoping I was hoping that you know Pusey and the Protestant Newman were right, that there's the sort of via media where we could find the Catholic Church in something else. And I used to, I used to play a game called uh, Spot the Heresy, though, and that's where, <laughs> I, that's where I really found that this was not true. You know, I used to go to the, Ang the Anglican service and at this glorious hymnody and careful attention to the rubrics and everything was just beautiful. And I'd go to the local Catholic parish with those god awful campfire songs, <laughs> and 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 uh, you know, and, and these these insipid jelly donut sermons that didn't tell you anything. You know, they were just <laughs> pure sugar. And I I thought, oh, I hope that I can find the Catholic Church in Anglicanism. You know, because there was so much else there. I used to play this game called Spot the Heresy, though. I'd listen to, you know, and try to see if I could spot any early church heresies and whatever the, the, uh, uh, the Episcopalian minister happened to be saying in, in his or her homily. <laughs> and, uh, and I, you know, I, I, in the course of two years, I got them all. I had to stretch a point on a couple of them. Apollinarianism was a little dicey. But, but you know, getting... getting um, <laughs> Even um, a few new ones, though, have been cro creeping yeah, in the last 10, 15 right. years. You know, but, but, you know, and, and uh, very intellectual sermons uh, as compared to these insipid, uh, yeah. uh, sugar-coated things that I w was the usual fare at the Catholic parish. But I dawned on me there is absolutely nothing that you can't proclaim from an Episcopalian pulpit. And that's not what I'm looking for. Wow. I'm looking for the Catholic Church. I hoped I could find it here, but I can't. And it was really a fairly sudden revelation to me. And so I went down to the pastor of that local uh, uh, Catholic parish on the second, in the second week of Lent in 89, presented myself and said, I'd like to be received into the church. What can I do? And we talked for a couple of hours. And he said, you know, uh, you can be received this Easter. Hmm. And, and so I was. And uh, Easter of 89. Let's take a break. First thing I'm going to ask you when we come back, though, is talk about your discernment to the diaconate. Okay. We take, we'll take a break right now and come back in a moment also with your questions for Deacon Nathan. See you in a bit. tonight is Deacon Nathan Allen. Thank you for condensing your story. A couple things though, just before we, we've got a number of emails and questions. A couple things quickly. The diaconate. Okay. At what point did you discern a call to the diaconate? You know, I had uh, 
from an early age uh, felt some sort of call to serving God full time. And, uh, and I didn't know what that meant. I assumed that it meant, you know, in some sort of capacity as a Protestant pastor or, min or you know, a, a missionary. And that sense of call never went away. Um, and as I was discerning my call to the Catholic Church, uh, discerning, um, you know, that I was thinking priesthood is out because by this time I was already a married man. And uh, and then I, I thought about diaconate, and that was you know, well, you're uh, a married man, you have to be 35 on ordination. And I was you know I was in my early 20s, <laughs> so I was uh, thinking, well, that that's that's I have a long time to think about this, but it never went away, hmm. and uh, um, and I really had that sense that I was being called to this full time sort of uh, ministry and. Uh, and so I presented myself when I was actually canonically too young to present myself. Um, I, if I had been accepted into the program that year in my archdiocese in St. Paul, I would have been uh, um, a year too young for ordination. Well, actually three weeks too young for ordination, but uh -huh. a year under my, my age within the dispensa dispensary power of the bishop. But uh, anyway, uh, so they told me to wait a year. And so I had sort of a propedeutic year to think about this and pray about this. And then I was received into the... Uh, uh, deacon formation program and uh, and then ordained in 2000. All right, well, so. we might get a question from a caller or writer about how do they discern the diaconate. Mm -hmm. Rather than my ask a question, let's see if the audience is interested in that. Let's take our first email. Here comes from Art. He writes to Nathan and Marcus. First, let me say that I am a Christian and Missionary Alliance member who loves the Journey Home program. I seldom miss it. Well, Art, I'm glad you enjoy the program. Glad you're watching. How did you adjust going from a non-liturgical form of worship the Roman Catholic style of worship. God mm -hmm. bless you both. Okay. Well, you know, I had, uh, this is what I was looking for, you know. So for me, it really wasn't that hard. Um, as a, from a pretty young age, and certainly by the time I was a teenager, it, it struck me as strange that, especially, you know, we'd be gathering with other missionaries, and then s the focus of of an evangelical sort of, of worship service is, of course, the sermon. And the person is, who is giving the sermon is preaching to a, um, you know, to people who were in the same sort of work, the same sort of, <laughs> of ministry. And, uh, and, uh, and I thought, this is, this is really odd. There, there should be something where we can express our faith that, that isn't, you know, in, in the context of, of this sermon, this message. So for me, it was rather actually rather easy to make that move. I know that it can be difficult for other people um, because you know it is a very different sort of thing. But I think that there's so much in the liturgy that is very natural to us that we want to use our bodies in worship. We want to use those five senses God gave us so that we smell and we taste and we hear and you know we feel. Um, everything that is around us. And, and, and that's something that you get in liturgy. And that was one of those things that I felt was missing and wished that I had. I remember with so many things when I made the transition from when I was a Presbyterian pastor to the Catholic worship. And I, I remember the first time though that I was in a, sitting in mass and the uh, priest finished the homily, went and genuflected before the altar, and then went and sat down, and sat silent mm -hmm. for about thirty seconds, and it to me it seemed like eternity, mm -hmm. because in in Presbyterian worship there was never a silent moment, right. music going or moving here or doing this or saying that, but this this uncomfortableness with this silence, mm -hmm. and even Vatican II calls us the importance of silence in worship, mm -hmm. and Absolutely. it's it, that's an important part of settling down. Mm -hmm. and feeling, experiencing the reality of God. I mean, so much mm -hmm. of worship is so different. But like you said, it makes sense. Right. And I think I internally we really, we do long for it because we long to worship God with everything we are. Mm -hmm. And that includes our smell and our, and our, yeah. our voices and our taste buds and our, you know, and, 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 uh, and tactily, you know. Let's go to our first caller. This, I think, is Linda. Hello, where are you calling from and what's your question? St. Louis. Yes, hello. Oh, you got a lot of ice, didn't you? Yes, sir. Well, I'm glad you're able to see the show. A lot of you don't even have power in that part of the world. What's your question for us tonight? 
Uh, Deacon Allen, forgive me, um, I called my question right away, and I may have missed part of your answer. As a cradle Catholic, would you advise us on that fine line between living the gospel as St. Francis did and speaking only when necessary, and sharing, offering perhaps information that our, our non-Catholic friends may, may long to know but don't, don't quite realize it, sir? Uh, again, that dividing line, what suggestions have you, sir? Thank you. Uh, ab uh, thank you so much for the question. Absolutely the best thing, the best evangelization that a person can do is what St. Francis told his followers. He said, go and proclaim the gospel, and if you must, use words. Okay. What we do, how we live, the joy we show in our lives speaks so much more than our words will. I mean, that, that's, that's, that's so important. You know, um, G.K. Chesterton uh, you know, is uh, one of my favorite writers, and uh, G.K. Chesterton, you know, it, it wasn't until he met his wife that he'd actually met a joyful Christian. You know, uh, and, that, and that's a real shame, because we're, we're called to love God and to enjoy, uh, enjoy Him, to worship Him. And, and, and uh, so that's, that's, that's clearly the, the most important thing. But we're also told in Scripture not to be ashamed of explaining the reason for our joy. And we have so much to be thankful for as Catholics. We have so much richness in the church fathers, in the liturgy, in the, in the sacramentals, in the liturgy of the hours. We have an incredibly rich, deep, scriptural and sacramental faith that we can, we can just uh, uh, cherish and express. And, uh, and so don't be ashamed of expressing that love for what you've got, but live the life first because that's going to speak more than anything. I was thinking about the witness of your friend that it, uh, didn't merely confront you with, with an intellectual explanation of the church, mm -hmm. but invited you to experience the penance of Lent. Right. I mean, and that was a powerful invitation that we can give to our own friends. To Absolutely. Them invite them to experience the yeah. beauty of our faith. My friend never asked me to convert. <laughs> you know, he never, that's not, that he wasn't, he wasn't, uh, you know, uh, it, there was never any altar call with just as I am being sung, you know. It was, uh, he was just presenting the beauty of the faith as he had discovered it, and that was, that was just uh, exciting. All right. I think we have an email about G.K. Chesterton here. Here it is. Uh, this comes from Catherine Hudson. Hello, I have a question for Deacon Allen. How much influence did G.K. Chesterton have on your journey to the Catholic Church? I also understand that you're involved with Dale Alquist from the Chesterton Society. Thank you. Okay. Well, in my mind, so that's part of the reason you're here right now. Right, right. Uh, we're actually here, uh, Marcus, uh, uh, shooting some scenes for uh, Dale's upcoming uh, fourth series on uh, J.K. Chesterton, the Apostle of Common Sense, and we were just filming a, a full-length G.K. Chesterton play <laughs> that will be broadcast after the editing is done uh, um, uh, sometime later on EWTN, sometime in the, in the coming months. Um, G.K. Chesterton actually played, I think, only an indirect part in my conversion to the faith because I discovered him later. I discovered him after I, I was already a Catholic. Um, but G.K. Chesterton clearly influenced C.S. Lewis. Yeah. And a lot of uh, C.S. Lewis's best bits are, have, their, you know, are, are, uh, have some uh, Chestertonian aspect to them. So um, indirectly, G.K. Chesterton certainly influenced uh, uh, my conversion by, by way of C.S. Uh, Lewis. You know, before I take the next caller, I'd like to ask you a question. You and I, besides see it, G.K. Chesterton, we also have similar things that we like. Uh, Hilar Belloc and uh, mm -hmm. uh, Woodhouse. Right. And uh, say a word to the audience about why we ought to read these great writers. <laughs> <laughs> well, Hilar Belloc is, uh, has been described as being um, like G.K. Chesterton, only more so. Um, <laughs> Belloc is really, uh, you know, he, he is the church militant. <laughs> but but yeah. uh, a very eclectic writer like Chesterton, um, very strong in history, mm -hmm. uh, very strong also in poetry. He was a better poet than Chesterton, frankly. Mm -hmm. um, though Chesterton has some great poems. Uh, he, uh, uh, essayist, um, uh, a novelist, uh, um, just a, a, a master of the language. 
And so I, I, I came to Belloc through Chesterton on the theory that you know you you get to know your friend your friends best by knowing their friends too, and so I've gotten to know Chesterton better by knowing Belloc, and I've got to know Belloc better by knowing Chesterton. <laughs> and I read them both, uh, you know, a great deal. Woodhouse is a different animal. Woodhouse <laughs> is you know bloody uh, Catholic. And Woodhouse uh, is not Catholic. Woodhouse is not interested generally in matters of faith unless it, it helps propel his story. Um, but he is just a lot of fun to read. Well, as you said, uh, knowing a friend, I mean, Evelyn Waugh, well-known Catholic writer, considered. Woodhouse, the greatest comic writer of the 20th That's century. That's right. And in fact, he, he called him the master, and he thought that he was the best uh, stylist in the English language alive. Yeah. Whether as a comic writer or, you know, I mean, just, and, and people were, were, and Belloc had the same opinion of him. Hmm. And uh, uh, Somerset Mom is quoted as when he heard that Belloc had said something like that. He said, oh, the old man must be slipping. I wonder what he ever could have thought of him meant by that, you know. <laughs> but but, but Waugh, you know, this great novelist, one, you know, who has three of his books are on the, the 20th century's top 100 that, uh, you know, that, that uh, uh, lists that came out at the end of the century. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, uh, but he thought that, uh, that, uh, that Woodhouse was the master. He called yeah. him the master with a capital M. Very humorous writer. Uh, um, in some ways, you'd think it's just you know sort of brain candy, but but uh, but his command of the language was yes. just brilliant. So it's really a quick read, a lot of fun. Right, and in many ways, that's why he's such a, worth reading. Mm -hmm. Is the language yeah. and the way he's able to turn a phrase and mm -hmm. uh, uh, to write such wonderful, enjoyable stories. Um, You've heard of uh, Wooster and Jeeves. He's the mm -hmm. one that created Wooster and Jeeves. So you may have seen and, and it seems so effortless. And then yeah. you look at the people, the, the writers writing about how he wrote. And yeah. he, he would labor over every word, yeah. every phrase, honing it, honing it, to make it sound exactly right. And it comes across as if he's just spinning a yarn and it's, yeah. you know, and without he any He wrote into his 90s, didn't he? Yeah, into his mm -hmm. 90s. He died with a book half finished. Amazing. He had something like 100 novels, just under 100 novels. Amazing. Let's take our next caller, Celeste from New Mexico. Hello, what's your question? Hello, Marcus and Deacon Nathan. Um, I was interested in when he, Deacon Nathan mentioned the um, different groups of missionaries, and also you mentioned the different branches of uh, churches on different intersections, or corners of an intersection. So I was curious, what is the term evangelical? Is that synonymous with Protestant, or is evangelical Protestant a certain group of denominations. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just trying to get a better feel for the term Protestant and Evangelical, okay. and also trying to figure out if these New Age um, denominations that I think are being lumped onto the uh, term Protestant are actually, with their beliefs, based upon what the Protestant Reformation originally came out okay. with, um, the rapture is kind of a departure from that Protestantism. Mm -hmm. Are they still considered Protestant? Mm -hmm. Great question, Celeste. Protestant really is anything, any form of Christianity that comes out of the great shipwreck of Christendom in the, in the 16th century. I mean, that's, it, you know, it starts with Luther and continues with Calvin and Zwingli and so forth. But um, anything that can really trace its origins to that moment, we'd call Protestant. There are other groups that broke away from the unity of Christendom earlier, you know, before the various right. councils, of the, uh, or after the various councils of the church, and then the big schism being the great schism of 1054, where the Eastern Orthodox churches broke off. But Protestant is anything really that draws its original, its origin, or is derived from something that derives its origin from, uh, you know, from the 16th century. Um, evangelical Protestants are Protestants who really take seriously the fundamental teachings of the Christian faith, the, which are summed up really in the Apostles' Creed as, uh, as everyone until about 150 years ago interpreted it. Okay? Um, and they take scripture seriously. Okay? They believe very strongly that we are justified by faith that uh, that we uh, that that it is absolutely essential to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, and in these things, they they are right. 
-hmm. You know, mm -hmm. there really are, and 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 I've never regretted my upbringing as an evangelical Protestant because, Marcus, that that love for God, that love for yeah. Scripture that was instilled in me. That's different, uh, incidentally, from some of the other what we might call mainline Protestants. You might hear that. Um, not to say that there aren't people with those same sensibilities in these organizations, but the older uh, uh, Protestant denominations, the Anglicans or Episcopalians, Lutherans, uh, um, you know, Presbyterians and so forth, uh, some of their larger denominations especially have seen a real falling away from the traditional understanding of what every Christian, Catholic, Orthodox, and Protestant had believed 150 yeah. years ago. And with, the, I was a Presbyterian, pastor of the largest Presbyterian denomination in America, mm -hmm. I was an evangelical. So I was one of those within those groups right. that was in line with basically what you're saying. That's right, yeah. We differed from the evangelical who was a Baptist, mainly because of some of our doctrinal issues, mm -hmm. but we would have been under that umbrella. Yeah. And, and maybe it is with the word evangelical comes the word evangelism, very right. committed to the calling to go ye therefore and make disciples. That was a very key part mm -hmm. of evangelicalism across the board. Right, absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. Let's take our next email, it comes from Linda. She writes, in watching the program, the deacon is describing so many of the feelings that my husband and I have been feeling. We have been searching for something that is missing in the denominations that we have been associated with. We watch the mass and explanation of the catechism on EWTN. There are so many questions being answered, sometimes even when we don't even realize it was a question. Where can we go and how do we start with very basic instruction? Thank you for writing, Linda. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Linda. That's really, um, that's really Im important, knowing where to go. And, uh, and there's in this world of the internet and you know, everything, there's, there's so much information out there. Um, you can't go wrong by looking at the Catechism of the no, Catholic Church. Right. That is a succinct, clear statement of what the Church believes. There's even a shorter version of it called the Compendium, Compendium oh, awesome. of the Catechism, which is a very clear presentation of what the Church teaches, what we believe as Catholics. Um, there, you know, if you want to get further into it, I mean, there's, there's the, the various papal documents you can read, um, if you're, especially if you're interested in why the church teaches the way it does on life issues. You know, you can look at John Paul II's Evangelium Vitae. But, uh, but that's really a good place to go and to find a good, solid Catholic parish. Uh, sometimes that can be difficult depending on your, uh, your area, but uh, um, uh, you know, uh, Catholic Answers is another great place. It's a website, Catholic Answers, you know, is another good place. EWTN also has some great question and answer forums on their website. And I'd also say that the Catholic uh, Religious Catalog on EWTN uh, has done a, you know, a careful job of selecting books and resources mm -hmm. to help you. So you might go to the, to the Religious Catalog and uh, do a search for a particular topic you're looking at. Catechism will be there, but then also mm -hmm. be writings of the early fathers and a variety of things that are helpful. And then, as you read these uh, these books that you that you know, if you find a, a book on the on the EWTN catalog and you order it and you and you enjoy it, and it it'll probably you know direct you to some other sources that are quoted in that book too, you know, and and, and uh, you yeah. know, there's there's a lot of information out there. There's also a lot of misinformation. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's go to David from Kansas. Hello. What's your question for us tonight? Oh yeah. Uh, I missed the first part of your show, so you may have answered this, but why are you wearing a gray shirt with a Roman collar? <laughs> okay. All right, David, fine. All right, well, let's see. I'm a canon lawyer, so should I give the canon law answer? Uh, <laughs> canon 284 of the Code of Canon Law obliges a cleric, a clergyman in the Catholic Latin writing of the Catholic Church, to wear a distinctive ecclesiastical garb, but... Canon 288 exempts permanent deacons from the obligation. That's why most permanent deacons don't wear it, okay? I mean, it, you know, we, we don't. But uh, my bishop, who is the, the Archbishop of St. Paul in Minneapolis, has asked that permanent deacons uh, wear a Roman collar if they wish, you know, especially when they're in act, you know, engaging in active ministry as a way of pointing us out as clergy, which we are, but not to wear black so that there's no confusion between us and priests. All right, very good, very good. Let's go to this next email. Kate is writing, Deacon Nathan, how, could you please describe your journey in understanding and accepting the real presence in the Holy Eucharist of the Catholic Church? What was your first Holy Communion like? Thank you for all that you do for the church. Okay. 
Um, well, first of all, I was going to ask, yeah. in your scent, when, you're, when your father was over there as a missionary, did mm -hmm. you celebrate communion? Yes, we did. And, you know, it was a, uh, well, it was a soda cracker and a shot glass of Welch's is what it was. <laughs> you know, uh, but, but we did, you know, we did do that. And uh, um, um, as I was exploring the faith, really, um, the real presence was not really a difficulty for me. I don't know why, but it wasn't. It seemed to me fairly clear as, you know, I, and I didn't mention this, uh, Mark, because earlier when I was talking about my, my father's a scholar and reading, yeah. you know, Greek New Testament, and at a point when I was young, uh, I was bored in school, and so he started teaching me Greek uh, in the afternoons as something to keep my interest in, in, in school. And so I was reading John chapter 6 you know, as an evangelical and reading it in the Greek and the verb that's used for eat my flesh, that verb that's translated eat is a very graphic word mm -hmm. that you really only use with, with, with food, with meat. You know, it's a munch and gnaw kind of word. It's a very graphic word. And I knew that, you know, as a, you know, even before I, I, uh, I, I became a Catholic or was even really exploring it. And so I really had this sense that that was one of those things that I was looking for. Um, and I knew that Martin Luther himself uh, was very strong on, on that particular aspect, and he and Zwingli nearly came to blows over it. Mm -hmm. um, he would point to the Bible and say, it says this is my body, you know. And so um, that was not really a terrible, a, a difficult thing for me. My first Catholic Holy Communion was, um, you know, it was this really a sense that I'd finally got to where I was, you know, that I was part of that body joined to everyone around me that I had wanted to be joined to, you know, for, for all that time. And that's, uh, yeah. Thanks for the question. Let's, let's say that we've got some evangelicals watching our program tonight. Okay. And uh, what would you like to say to them to encourage them to consider making the same journey you've made? Okay. Well, you know, um, again, G <laughs> one of my favorite writers, G.K. Chesterton, talks about uh, the three stages of conversion. And the first stage is that stage where, you know, we're, we're being fair to the Catholic Church. And I think most evangelicals are now, Marcus. You know, we, we uh, um, you know, especially with the pro-life movement, and, and, you know, we, we're in more contact with each other. And, and that builds relationships and it builds respect. And then there's that excitement of discovering the Catholic Church. You know, discovering, the second stage is discovering everything uh, the Church has to offer and everything, and it can be very exhilarating. And then there's a stage of running away. <laughs> um, the thing to do, the thing to do, Marcus, is just to pray and ask God to lead you because he will. And you have to be open to letting him lead you even where you don't want to go. Remember at the end of John's Gospel when Jesus tells Peter, someday you'll be led where you don't want to go. And he's talking about the kind of death Peter will die. But conversion of heart, whether that means coming into full communion with the Catholic Church or those daily conversions that we have really are a death. And we go where Jesus leads us, even if we don't want to go there. Hmm. We go there with that patient reliance that he won't lead us astray. He'll lead us where he wants us so that we can experience the fullness of what he has to offer us. When you think about what Peter would be led to have to believe mm -hmm. in the next 20, 30 years of his life, for one, he'd have to uh, uh, exclaim to these new believers that you have to be open up to the Gentiles equally. Right. That was rough yeah, for him to swallow, and that they wouldn't have to be, of all things, circumcised, right. because that had been the rule. So sometimes where Jesus is to look at what the church has been guided by the Spirit to teach. It mm -hmm. might be different than the way you always understood your faith. Right. And, and that's what you had to go through. And absolutely. And Peter himself, he had some difficulties with that and went back on it and <laughs> had to be pointed out by Paul that he had to follow through with what he had been told. So, Deacon? Thank you. Thanks it's so much. It's a blessing. Yes, absolutely.
May Almighty God bless you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Deacon, thank, thank you for joining thank us on the so journey much. home and for your for your work. And uh, I know that. Um, what's the name of the book? Four Men. Oh, the the Four Men. Yes, uh, I'm uh, doing. It's a bell website. What's right? Quick, oh, quick. the Four Men dot com is a is that's my uh, or four. I'm sorry, the Four Men at Yahoo dot com. That's an email. I'm you know working on a book and. Uh, so if you want to follow through and follow on that, please let me know. I want to make sure you get in. You're doing an annotated version of the, of, the Four of Men. Of one of Belloc's books called The Four Men. So yeah. if, you, if you like Belloc like I do, you might want to go to that website and find out more about it. Four Men yeah, at Yahoo.com. Yahoo. Yahoo. Com. That's my email address. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Deacon. Thank okay. you for joining us on the journey home. I hope this has been encouraging to your faith. God bless you. We'll walk this journey together. God bless you.